Okay, everyone, this is the third and final part uh, of the video lecture for chapter 12. Um, so up to this point, we've been talking about uh, selection, of course, and for our discussion, the basic assumption has been that our populations are infinitely large. That means that all the changes that we've seen in allele frequencies um, have been solely due to natural selection. If your population is infinitely large, then drift has no effect, right? Okay, but natural populations are never infinitely large. An infinitely large population simply doesn't exist. And often they're very small. I mean, think about endangered species. So this means that genetic drift does play a role in the evolution of populations too, just like natural selection does. Um, and remember that we have a, <coughs> excuse me, a way of describing the size of the population that takes into account uh, the effect of genetic drift. That is the effective population size. Remember, n sub e, okay? So effective population size uh, basically describes the population in the sense of only those individuals who are involved, involved in reproduction because those are the ones that are passing their genes on to the next generation individuals in any given generation that are not reproducing are not doing that. So an effective population size can be quite a bit smaller than the total population, and thus drift can be acting at a much higher level than what you might expect based on total population size. Okay, so the, effect, the effective size of a population then determines how strong drift is in relation to natural selection. So, when selection is strong relative to population size, that means drift is going to be negligible. Okay, selection is more important than drift, in other words. And we have a way of sort of uh, describing this um, quantitatively. And so we have, if you take four times your effective population size and multiply that by the effect, or the selection coefficient rather, and you get a number greater than one, then that means selection is sort of driving the ship, basically. Selection is really important here, okay? All right, but again, if you take four multiplied by your effective population size multiplied by the uh, selection coefficient and you get a number less than one, then that means that selection is relatively weak compared to population size, so drift is gonna be significant, all right? In this case, allele frequencies are shifting mostly due to drift. In this case, they're shifting mostly due to selection. All right, so what if we consider a population where heterozygotes are less fit than homozygotes? So in this case, the adaptive landscape has two peaks where uh, homozygous, or I'm sorry, individuals homozygous for A1 allele, let's say, are, are fit, and those that are homozygous for A2 allele are fit it's the heterozygotes who are the least fit. So again, this would be a case of heterozygote disadvantage. And that's what we see here in this figure. So again, we're looking at an adapt adaptive landscape that we saw in part two of this um, chapter presentation. So in this case, remember we have our allele frequency or frequency of A1 allele increasing on the, um, or changing rather on the x-axis. We have our mean fitness of the population on the y-axis. So if you have A1 allele that's rare, it's present at very low frequency, say 0 0.10, then you have to think about what that means for A2 allele. A2 allele is going to be very abundant in that case, 0.9, right? Remember, you add the two of those, they have to add up to 1.0, okay? All right, also notice up here we have our relative fitnesses of the various genotypes. So A1, A1 homozygote, the most fit. A2, A2 homozygote, 0.8 fitness, relative fitness, and heterozygotes, 0.4 relative fitness. So if we have A1 allele present at 0.1, <coughs> excuse me, that means A2 is more abundant, and so most individuals are A2, A2 homozygotes, right? But that means the population is not as fit as it might be if we had most individuals being A1, A1 homozygotes. But that again requires A1 be the most abundant allele, all right? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry guys. So 
In the middle here, we have the lowest fitness that we can have for our population. And that is going to be when we have the highest frequency of heterozygotes. So in this case, we'd have a frequency of around 0.4 for A1 allele. And that's the frequency of A1, 0.4, and thus A2, 0.6, where you get the highest frequency of heterozygotes in this particular case. The reason why it's not 0.5.5 .5 is because uh, one allele and the other have different fitnesses. One is 1.0, one is 0.8. So that's why these numbers don't add up, or that's why you don't get your highest frequency of heterozygotes at 0.5. Anyway, <clears throat> what we have here is called an adaptive valley because you can have a population that's very low frequency of A1, but it can still be relatively fit where individuals are mostly A2, A2 homozygotes. But there's no way that selection could take that population and convert it to one where A1, A1 homozygotes are more abundant because to do so, you would have to increase the frequency of A1, going from here to here, for example. <coughs> Sorry, guys. That means that if the A1 frequency increased, the population mean fitness would have to decrease because you'd be, be creating more heterozygotes. You'd be heading down into the adaptive valley and then up again to a, a different uh, adaptive peak where A1, A1 homozygotes are the most abundant. How could selection take a population that's relatively fit and make it less fit only to then make it more fit again? Selection never reduces the selective, uh, or the adaptiveness or the fitness rather, of a population. So there's no way that if a population is already adaptive in the sense that it has a whole bunch of A2, A2 homozygotes, there's no way selection could shift it to the other adaptive peak um, by increasing the frequency of A1, because by increasing the frequency of A1, the population is becoming less fit, and selection would force it back the other way to becoming more fit again. You couldn't get across that adaptive valley through the effect of drift alone. I'm sorry, sorry, through the effect of selection alone. Because again, this would first require the population to become more poorly adapted so that it could then become better adapted. And how could selection do that? It cannot do that. So in order for the population to shift from one adaptive peak to another, in other words, across that adaptive valley, drift would have to interact with selection. Okay. Now, drift could shift allele frequencies during population bottlenecks, for example, such that once the population begins to grow again, selection is able to take it back up the other slope. So let's look at how this might happen. Okay, <clears throat> so as an example of what I was talking about before, there's no way that if you have a population that has a low frequency of A1 allele right here, and that's shifting it to one adaptive peak, there's no way the frequency of A1 could increase to the point where the population goes to another peak where A1, A1 is homozy homozygotes are abundant because it would have to cross that adaptive valley where it's becoming less fit only then to become more fit. If it did shift due to drift, for example, and it didn't reach that unstable equilibrium point of 0.5, then selection is going to force it back up this way again. Okay, selection would force it back that way. However, if the effect of drift is large enough, say we start off with a situation where our allele frequencies are here, right, get my pointer to work. If we have enough drift such that the A1 uh, allele increases enough and A2 decreases enough, that A1 goes just to the other side of that point of um, unstable equilibrium, then drift would take it back up the other direction toward a new adaptive peak, as you see here. I'm sorry, not drift. Selection would take it back up toward a new peak. Because in this case, uh, going that way is the only way to become more fit. If it's here, going this way again makes it less fit because you're going back toward that adaptive valley. So drift, or so selection would have to take it back up in this direction. So this does require then that selection and drift sort of interact with each other, okay? All right, so when multiple stable equilibria, such as all A1, A1 homozygotes or all A2, A2 homozygotes 
when multiple stable equilibria exist, selection and drift may interact to achieve what selection by itself is simply not capable of. So it's important to consider the two together. All right, now let's talk about molecular signatures of natural selection. Can we see evidence in DNA sequences, for example, of past natural selection? Turns out we can. Studies of selection have historically focused on investigation of phenotypic characteristics and have uh, mainly targeted lab and natural populations in the field, uh, looking at you know, differences in phenotypes or frequencies of phenotypes uh, due to possibly selective forces. But modern molecular techniques have now made it possible to study selection at the level of the gene through variation in DNA sequences. This is possible because of the expectations of genetic variation within a population that stem from neutral theory, the neutral theory of molecular evolution. <coughs> Excuse me. Remember <coughs> that the frequency of heterozygotes, right, frequency of heterozygotes at equilibrium between drift and mutation is equal to four times our effective population size times the neutral mutation rate divided by that again, minus one, sorry, plus one. Okay, so this gives us an estimate then of the average heterozygosity in a population when we take into account the effect of drift, which tends to reduce genetic variation, and mutation, which increases variation. There's an equilibrium value between those two opposing forces, and that's what average heterozygosity is, okay? So we have the effective population size here. That's gonna be the effect of drift. And we have our mutation rate, okay, which obviously is uh, the effect of mutation. All right, so this formula then takes into account the effect of both of these and gives us an estimate of where they sort of settle out in opposition to each other in terms of average heterozygosity. So at equilibrium, under neutral theory, nucleotides at different sites should not be correlated because of re recombination, um, crossing over during meiosis. Even recombination between closely linked sites will eventually, if given enough time, lead to linkage equilibrium. Okay, so let's go back a little bit and, and talk about genetic hitchhiking and some of those other things like linkage disequilibrium that we talked about in a previous chapter. So let's say that we have um, a replicated chromosome here, right? Okay, and um, let's imagine that we have a mutated site, so a mutated gene on that chromosome. All right, well, uh, let me get some different colors going on here, all right, just to make this easier. Let's say we have gene uh, B very closely related, or li located rather, uh, with that uh, mutated gene and then let's say down here, we have gene C, which is quite far away from it. All right, so we have our original mutated gene there. Gene B, let's call it gene A. Gene B in green is very close to it. So a crossover event during crossing over in meiosis is very unlikely to occur between those two genes, right? So we would say that these two genes are linked. Now, a crossover event uh, is very likely to occur here because there's so much distance between gene C and the mutated gene A. And much more likely to occur there than here. So these two are not going to be as tightly linked. They're very likely to get separated in this section or this gene end up on a different chromosome uh, as a result of a crossing over. So when we have this gene, gene B, that tends to go forward into the future with gene A because gene A now has... Um, an advantageous mutation and selection favors it, we say that these two are linked and so they're present at higher frequencies together than they would be due to random effects alone and we say that they are in linkage dis equal librium. Okay, linkage dis equilibrium. All right, or LD as we call it. Okay, so Recombination, though, eventually, given enough time, can separate those two, okay? So, how does selection then leave a signature in, in genes? Well, let's think about this scenario. 
Let's say we have a new advantageous mutation that occurs at a single nucleotide site in a gene, such as right here, for example, like I said. Positive selection for the new mutation increases the frequency of neutral variant nucleotides, such as, for example, that one, um, linked to that mutation. So this one goes forward into the future at higher rates along with this one. This one's being selected for, that one's being pulled along because it's close and not likely to get separated by crossing over. That again is called genetic hitchhiking. We've talked about that. So if our mutation here is eventually fixed in the population, all linked neutral variation that used to exist will have been eliminated. So you have at this point in time when the mutation occurs, lots of other vari uh, versions of alleles or genes on this side and that side, but eventually the ones very close to it because of hitchhiking um, get passed in the future along with the one that's being selected for and eventually you get a long section of a chromosome that has the same alleles on it and almost everyone has it because it's been favored, right? The one gene is being pulled forward, the other is sort of along with on the coattails of that gene and so everybody ends up having that section of that um, chromosome. That section where you have all those different genes, alleles, that are the same in everyone around that mutated gene is called a haplotype. Just think of it as a long section of a chromosome that, that has the same, that in everyone has the same alleles, basically. Okay? That process where everyone ends up at some point in the future with that mutated gene plus the same alleles around it as everybody else, that is called a selective sweep. Selective sweep. All right, so if the mutation is eventually fixed in the population and all linked neutral variation that used to exist will have been eliminated, in other words, all copies of the gene are now originated from or coalesce to the original mutant gene, and the same is true of the, gene, the alleles for the genes around it. That's our selective sweep. Prior to fixation, neutral sites that are linked to the mutant site will show linkage disequilibrium since they are associated with a mutant sequence at a higher frequency than would be expected under neutral theory. Okay, so let's take a look. So imagine that we have um, eight different copies of the same chromosome. So this is the same chromosome in eight different individuals, okay? We have different genes, right? And so you see that in this chromosome, we have uh, this gene represented by the green box, these genes represented by the red uh, circles, and so on. And the second chromosome on the different, in a different person has exactly the same alleles. They're identical, right? Okay, this one's a little bit different. You see a different gene there, or allele. Um, here you see a different one here as well. So you do get some variation, right? But we have a gene in the middle here that's the same in all these, not shown, but here we have a new mutation develop in it. See the star? All right. That's a new mutation. It's advantageous, okay? Well, let's assume that we have a situation where a species that reproduces asexually, where we have no crossing over, no recombination, right? That new mutation can be selected for and all the offspring from that individual would have exactly the same chromosome sequence of genes, as you see, right? So no variation around that mutation at all. All those alleles are the same on either side of that mutation. That would be an incomplete sweep because not everybody has it. It's just the individual who had it and their offspring that are clones or, or um, genetically identical to that original parent, all right? Now, in the case of a complete sweep, everyone eventually has it. So at some point along in the future, the individuals in the population can all be traced back to that one individual parent, and so they all have exactly the same mutant gene and the same, oops, sorry, and the same variation or lack thereof around it. That's a selective sweep. You have a long section of the chromosome, and everybody has exactly the same alleles for the same sets of genes around some mutated gene. All right, in the case of a sexually reproducing species where you do get recombination, okay, again, you'll have um, a selective sweep here. You see that with everybody having the same mutation. And because that mutation is favored and this section of the chromosome doesn't get chopped up by recombination, 
you end up with the same long segment of that chromosome with the same alleles for the same genes in all the individuals. But this blue section here represents a crossover event where a new section of, or a section of a chromosome, of a different chromosome is tacked on by crossing over, and that will start to break up that homogeneous um, set of alleles or genes. Okay, now, the further that is away from the mutant gene, the original one, the more likely you are to get a crossover event. So you wouldn't be very likely to get a crossover event right here, but you could further away, be more likely. So crossover events will start to occur and sort of chop in from the ends or the edges and eventually erode from the edges in toward the middle that genetic homogeneity, that similarity. And that's what you see up here. You see there's a new section from a crossover event. There's one. There's one. Here's a large section that's been replaced. So that um, large section that's our selective sweep will eventually be eroded the more time goes on. But it takes a lot of time. Okay. So a selective sweep causes reduced sequence variability and greater linkage disequilibrium. Right? We're seeing linkage disequilibrium here. Uh, greater sequence... Um, or, or little sequence variability, a selective sweep causes reduced sequence variability and greater disequilibrium near the mutated site, and that creates a signature of positive selection. Let's take a look. So this figure is showing you really three different things. They're all related. We're going to focus on variability, the black line, and linkage disequilibrium. Okay, so here we have a mutated site right there. It's our sequence position for a mutation that's occurred. It's an advantage, let's say. All right, let's look at the red line first. Red line is linkage disequilibrium. So you see we have a peak right there. Well, that peak represents the um, point of greatest sequence similarity. All right, greatest sequence similarity. And as you move away from that peak, you see the similarity drops until eventually you get here where you really don't see, you see a lot more variation around that mutated site, okay? Now, if you look at variability, okay, here we have um, low variability at that mutated site. The further away from you go, of it you go, the more variability you get. So you have high linkage disequilibrium here, that translates into, or is a result of, low variability at that site. So you get this very characteristic sort of pattern of variability and linkage disequilibrium around a mutated site. That suggests that mutated site was an advantage and it was selected for and because the genes on either side of it might have been neutral, or at least those DNA sequences were neutral, they got pulled forward along with that mutated site and that's what causes the linkage disequilibrium. The fact that these are present along with each other and that mutated site at higher frequencies than you would expect due to random uh, factors alone. Okay, so let's imagine we have two mutations. One's neutral, the other is advantageous. They'll accumulate in a population at different rates. The neutral mutation will accumulate by drift because selection can't see it, it's neutral, and the advantageous mutation by positive selection. This means that all descendant copies of a favorable mutation will have a more recent common ancestor than descendant copies of a neutral mutation because, yes, drift can cause a neutral mutation to go to fixation, but it's going to take longer than selection, than it would take selection to drive an advantageous mutation to um, fixation. So that means that these copies will be more similar in sequence due to less time for accumulation of subsequent neutral mutation. All right, what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at this figure. Okay, on the left-hand side here, figure A, we have a situation where we have a neutral mutation that's not being affected by selection, okay? And there is that neutral mutation right there. Okay, now it's possible through drift alone that over time it could go to fixation. So here we are in modern day, and all of these gene copies are descended from that original ancestral mutated gene copy. But that was quite a bit of time in the past when that happened. It took a lot of time for that to go to fixation by drift. And the more time, the more mutations, shown as the yellow circles, the more mutations can develop. This is saying seven, but actually count about eight or nine. Point is, here you have a lot more time since that mutation 
and more time means more mutations, more subsequent mutations. Here in panel B, you have an advantageous mutation, which goes to fixation relatively rapidly, a lot less time, and that means there's less time for mutations to develop. There are about five here, but that means that these sequences will be much more similar to each other than these sequences because here there was less time involved between when the mutation occurred and when it went to fixation, so less time for mutations. So in a situation where you have positive selection, these sequences that all descend from that will be more similar than when you have fixation of a neutral allele by drift. Okay, so how do we quantify a selection signature? How do we how do we measure whether or not selection is really working on a gene, either against it or for it, let's say? Well, we do it by looking at the proportion of functional changes. In other words, the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous mutations. All right, remember in um, the previous chapter, we talked about synonymous versus non-synonymous mutations. And I said that if a mutation um, occurs that changes an RNA codon, a three-letter sequence, from one codon to another, and both of those codons code for the same amino acid because of the um, because of the um, redundancy in the genetic code, then if it doesn't change the amino acid, it doesn't change the protein. There's no effect on amino acid sequence of the protein. That would be a non-synonymous, I'm sorry, that would be a synonymous mutation, okay? The mutation still actually codes for the same amino acid, synonymous. But if you have a mutation that changes a codon, say that coded for, for lysine, to one that codes for phenylalanine, that's a non-synonymous because it does change the amino acid sequence of the polypeptide that makes the protein. And that could therefore affect protein structure. And selection could see it, in other words, because it might well cause the protein to work less well, or maybe it causes it to work better, who knows. Okay, so we can look at then the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous mutations, and if that ratio equals 1.0, then we know we would have um, the same number of non-synonymous to synonymous mutations. That would tell us that selection is not operating um, on those non-synonymous mutations. If we have the same number of these as we do those, then selection is not operating to eliminate any of those non-synonymous mutations. Okay? That would mean that that mutation then is selectively neutral. Okay? If that's the case, you wouldn't expect it to be more or less common than a synonymous mutation. So your ratio should be about 1.0. All right, but what if we have a non-synonymous to synonymous ratio less than 1.0? Well, this suggests that this number is smaller, right? Okay, in that case, um, non-synonymous mutations have apparently negatively affected protein function and have been selected against. That's why they're present at lower frequencies. Selection is weeding them out, basically. So if you divide a small number by a larger number, you get a number less than one, all right? So that ratio then of less than one suggests that selection is operating against these non-synonymous mutations, which means they're not neutral. They're deleterious, in other words. All right. What if we have a non-synonymous to synonymous ratio, um, oops, sorry, that is greater than 1.0? Well, now this suggests that our non-synonymous number is larger than our synonymous number. That's how you get a number greater than one. And so that suggests that we have um, mutations, non-synonymous mutations that are going to fixation more frequently than they would by drift alone. That suggests that selection is operating on them, okay? That suggests that selection is operating on them, um, positive selection. In this case, we'd have negative selection, okay? All right, so we can look at that ratio and that tells us something about the forces involved in uh, driving the evolution of that, that gene sequence, for example. All right, now let's talk about haplotype length go back to the idea of haplotype uh, length and linkage disequilibrium.
So alleles with high frequency and strong linkage disequilibrium with other alleles will form a long haplotype with high frequency. We talked about that. So linkage disequilibrium that extends over a long distance along a chromosome likely indicates a young allele in a chromosome region with normal recombination. Uh, this is because recombination, as I said, will eventually break up linked alleles uh, if given enough time. So knowing this, it's possible then to estimate the age of a haplotype based on the pattern of linkage disequilibrium decay. In other words, the breakup of linked alleles at various distances from the haplotype core where that original advantageous mutation occurred. A good example of this is mutation in the LCT gene allowing for digestion of lactose, which is found in a haplotype that is long and has very high frequency in Eurasian populations when compared to non-mutant LCT alleles from people or populations that are unable to uh, metabolize lactose milk sugar as adults. So most Eurasians, and that includes people in North America which are, are basically descended from European stock. Um, are capable as adults of breaking down milk sugar. We are not lactose intolerant. Okay, some people are lactose intolerant, but, but in Eurasian populations and North American populations, that's generally not uh, the case. Okay, um, however, you look at populations from the Middle East, for example, and mostly adults there are lactose intolerant. They are incapable of digesting milk sugar. Okay, we'll see why that might be a little bit later on toward the end here. Um, but when you have, if you look at people in uh, the Middle East as toddlers, so age, you know, infancy up to about two or three, something like that, they actually can break down lactose because it's beneficial in that sense, you know, if you're nursing off your mother, okay? Um, but then they lose that ability after about age three or four, something like that. Um, in Western populations, uh, that's not true. We are born lactose tolerant and we remain tolerant for all of our lives for the most part, with the exception of a few people. Okay, well, when we look at those Eurasian populations and we look at the length of the haplotype around that mutation, here's what we see. So this is the position of our original mutation that allowed for lactose tolerance, okay, LCT. All right, now let's look at lactose intolerant populations first. Those are shown here in orange. You see that they do have a fairly long haplotype around their original version of the gene that does not allow them to break down lactose as adults, okay? But, so at some point in the past, it suggests that that was probably an advantage because you do have what looks like to be a relatively old selective sweep here for that mutation that um, allowed them to break down lactose only as uh, very young children, all right? But then we have a new mutation here that gives Eurasians the ability to break down lactose even as adults. And you can see how long in some cases, that haplotype is. It's very long. I mean, you're talking about from minus 1 million up to about 1.5 million base pairs on either side of that original mutation. And you see that in Eurasian populations, everybody has this central core. This is all an area where that gene is in the middle. It was selected for, and you end up with everybody having the same DNA sequence essentially around it, okay? That's the result of our selective sweep. And in some cases, it's very long, and this suggests it's relatively young. So it's very long, and everybody has it. That suggests it's young, and it was highly selected for, that original mutation. All right, so the presence then of this long LCT haplotype at high frequency and the pattern of um, linkage disequilibrium decay around it very little because of the long haplotype at this point, um, suggests that the selective sweep for the ability to digest lactose occurred relatively recently. Uh, it suggests anywhere between 2,200 years ago and 20,000 years ago. Interestingly enough, in Europe, dairy farming started, we think, about 9,000 years ago. So is there a correlation there? Is that just coincidence or is there a relationship? Well, we think there's a relationship. If, when dairy farming comes in, into play about 9,000 years ago, any individuals in that population who had that mutation that would allow them to break down lactose as adults are at a definite advantage. Why? Because now they have access all their lives to a ready source of protein that most other people in the population who are lactose intolerant beyond age three or four 
cannot utilize. That's a powerful selective force that would then drive that newly mutated LT LCT gene forward in the future, pulling all those genes on either side of it along with it. And so you get now here, what, 9,000 years later, everybody basically having that same haplotype or centered around that original mutated gene. Okay, And that explains why people now in North America and in, in, in Europe, for example, are capable of breaking down lactose as adults, but people in the Middle East where agriculture never really developed like that, uh, especially dairy farming, uh, are today not capable of doing that because that mutated gene, if it even occurred in their populations, uh, and it might have, was not a selective advantage because they weren't practicing dairy farming. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? I think so. All right, that wraps up uh, chapter uh, 12 then on the genetical theory of natural selection. Hope you guys have enjoyed it.